It is good to be with you again, to study with you tonight. I hope to see you on Sunday, either at 9 or at 10.30 in the morning, if at all possible. And if you can sign up, that really helps. Use the Sign Up Genius account. If you need any help with that, uh, get in touch with either me or with Kenna. And really, anybody from the Four Lakes congregation who has an email address in our church directory should be able to do that for you and sign up. It is not a difficult process. Uh, but it does take a, a few steps, and uh, most of us are able to figure that out. So uh, get in touch with somebody who's done it before if you need help doing that. We really appreciate that. Uh, I'm down in my study tonight again. I'm actually doing this on Tuesday night, and our neighbors have been installing a hardwood floor, and they're two houses away, and I tested it, and I could still hear some of the, the pounding <laughs> a few minutes ago, but uh, hopefully it's not too distracting. It wasn't too bad. Kind of could hear it in the background a little bit, but uh, they've been busy over there tearing out carpet and putting in hardwood floors and I'm sure it's going to look great but uh, anyway it makes a recording a class a little bit more difficult. Uh, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts and Acts of course explains the growth of the early church. It's written by Luke, a medical doctor to a man by the name of Theophilus and it covers a period of time from roughly 30 to 60 AD, so 30 years in the mid first century. So that's where we are. We're looking at this book of history. Now, up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first uh, six chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize chapter 1 with the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. In chapter 2, we looked at the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 3, there was a man who could not walk, and he was carried by his friends and then cured by Peter and John. So chapter 3 is carried and cured. In chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples. And so they continue on in spite of that opposition. In Acts chapter 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested and then they're let out of jail by the angel, but they go right back to preaching. But we had the empty jail. We've summarized Acts 6 with the words first deacons, but always with the question mark. The Greek-speaking widows are getting overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The apostles cannot neglect prayer and preaching, and so they give some qualifications. The church chooses seven men to meet those qualifications, and they are then appointed by the apostles to take care of that problem. And so they seem to be doing the work that deacons would do but they're never explicitly given the label deacon. They don't have that title in this chapter, and so we always keep the question mark there. Uh, then in Acts chapter 7, one of these servants, a man by the name of Stephen, he continues preaching, and he's doing wonderful deeds. He's performing miracles. Uh, the authorities get upset by that. They have him arrested, and most of Acts chapter 7 is a record of Stephen's sermon, basically a history of God's people, uh, highlighting all the ways the Jewish people and especially their leaders have completely blown it through the years. They have accused him of blaspheming Moses and speaking out against the temple, but we've noticed in this sermon last week how Stephen is extremely respectful of Moses. Uh, it's their ancestors who were actually disrespectful of Moses and rebelled against Moses. We also noticed an emphasis in chapter 7 in his sermon on God meeting with people in places outside the temple and away from the temple. And so our summary of Acts chapter 7 has been great hero, G, the letter G, great hero, referring to Stephen's courage in preaching to the Sanhedrin. Uh, the theme of his sermon is basically, you people are completely missing the point just as your forefathers did. And we noted that uh, this is sometimes referred to as Stephen's defense. And yes, he is giving a defense, but he's really not defending himself. His point here is not to get himself out of trouble. Uh, but his point is to defend the Lord and his church, regardless of what might happen next. So up to this point, we've looked at maybe 95% of Stephen's sermon. And so we pick up tonight really with the conclusion, starting in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. So let's start tonight with Acts 7, 51 through 53. Very short paragraph here as Stephen continues his sermon before the council. So addressing the Sanhedrin. He's out there in the middle, he's on the spot, and this is how Stephen continues. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. 
Well, Stephen then makes this uh, very personal with these men that he's preaching to. He gives a history lesson, a, a vast majority of Acts chapter 7, outlining, as I said, some of the many ways that their forefathers had stubbornly turned away from God, the same forefathers uh, that these men practically worshipped. They held them in high regard, and now Stephen brings it home. I'm thinking of the prophet Nathan as he tells the story of the rich man, if you remember that, uh, stealing his neighbor's lamb, and he, he explains this to King David, and he allows uh, David just to get incredibly angry, and then he drives it home with, you are the man. You're the one that this story is about, and that is what Stephen is doing here. This is the so what part of the lesson. This is where it gets personal. So these people love David. These people love Moses. Uh, but Stephen is pulling a Nathan here, and he's putting them on the spot. He refers to them as stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. I know in traditional uh, speech communication type classes, I know we've learned over and over again that you should probably not try to insult the audience. And you really don't want to uh, make them feel unnecessarily uncomfortable by insulting them or calling them names. And, and yet, really, that is exactly what Stephen does here. Um, I'm remembering, I'm, I remember visiting the church down in Crystal Lake when our kids were really young and uh, one of them came up from Bible class and uh, whispered to us, our teacher used the S word, the S word in Bible class. And, and we thought, oh no, this is not good. Uh, how, do, how do we handle this situation here? The teacher used the S word and, and we tried to calm things down just a little bit and we tried to calm down as parents. And and we asked whichever kid it was, I can't remember, but uh, ex exactly what did the teacher say? And with a look of shock, our, our child whispered back to us and said, he said, stupid. He said, stupid. And oh, what a relief there, you know. And uh, But we, we remembered a conversation that we had had a few months before that. And somebody in, in the heat of the moment as a little kid had called somebody stupid. And, and so we had to explain this is not a word that we use. And, and when we said that, we weren't really anticipating all possible scenarios here. We were just trying to explain that we don't call people stupid. In an argument, we don't say you're stupid. That's not a thing that we say. And I think we all understand that when, when raising a four, five, or six-year-old, sometimes we need to remind them that we generally don't go around calling people names. Um, but then again, sometimes people do in fact do some very stupid things, and sometimes we need to communicate this. And so here, Stephen is very clearly calling these men some names, isn't he? He refers to them as stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. So I guess in a way, Stephen uses the S word, stiff-necked, doesn't he? Uh, stiff-necked is to be stubborn. Not yielding to good advice, not yielding to God's instruction in this case. Uh, like their forefathers, they are stubbornly, there's another S word, they are stubborn. They are stubbornly refusing to submit their lives to God. When I think of somebody being stiff-necked, I think of trying to wrestle a kid into a car seat. Uh, most of us have been in that situation. And I think I might have actually used this for some of my children at one point. But, uh, you know, you go to put a kid in a car seat and they stiffen up, and they become stiff as a board. You will not buckle me into this thing. And that seems to be the attitude that uh, the Sanhedrin is having toward Jesus and the apostles. Uh, through their actions, and sometimes through their words, they're saying, no matter what you might say, no matter how clear you might make it, uh, we will not listen. Uh, the other part of this is uncircumcised in heart and ears. And as I see it, he's referring back to the covenant of circumcision, obviously, first established with Abraham. Uh, to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And if you wanted to insult a fellow Jew, probably one of the worst insults you could give was to accuse somebody of being uncircumcised. You'd be referring to them as a barbarian, basically, as a Gentile, an outsider. Uh, you may remember David referred to Goliath as an uncircumcised Philistine. It's kind of a strange insult to us today, but to the Jewish people, that was that was pretty serious. And uh, here in this passage, Stephen specifically refers to the heart and ears, uncircumcised in heart and ears. So he's obviously not referring to literal circumcision, but he's using this symbolically, the idea of being stubborn, hard-hearted. Uh, your heart and your ears are covered. You're not listening. Um, in Leviticus 26, 41, God referred to the people as having an uncircumcised heart. 
And so this is something that God has brought up in the past. And these educated men probably would have remembered that quote from Leviticus. In Jeremiah 9.26, God refers to uh, certain ones from the house of Israel who were uncircumcised of heart. And so that's used a couple times in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And so the term can be used symbolically, referring uh, to Israelites who are not acting like Israelites by not listening to God. So it sometimes was used literally as an insult to non-Jews, but sometimes it was used by God himself, uh, referring to an attitude that these people were having. Uh, then as a bonus, he also accuses them of always resisting the Holy Spirit. Um, I know um, we had a marriage and family therapy type class, and I remember one of those units was on giving advice on how to fight fair. Uh, if you're at, when you're married, you're living with somebody for a number of decades, you're going to get in disagreements, there are going to be fights through the years, but one of those rules for fighting fair, one of those kind of ground rules going into it, is to try to avoid always and never statements. And, and generally speaking, they aren't true. You always do this. You never do this. And, and in a way, that's not fair because very rarely will somebody always or literally never do or not do a certain thing. Uh, but I noticed reading through this again that, that that's what Stephen is saying here. You are always resisting the Holy Spirit. And of course, here, Stephen seems to be inspired. He's giving this sermon filled with the Holy Spirit. And literally always, these men in a leadership position, instead of yielding to God's Spirit, they are always resisting. They are always against God. They're always fighting back. And again, almost like the kiddo not wanting to get in the car seat. You know, we are not going to do that. Whatever it takes, we are not going that direction. And Stephen explains that they're doing this just as your fathers did. That's probably not a, a good thing to bring up in a marriage argument either. You're just like your mother or something like that. Probably not good. But Stephen breaks all those rules. You're, you're always like this, just like your fathers were. So this stubbornness runs in the family. Stephen, though, he doesn't leave it there, does he? He continues. Notice in verse 52, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? So he puts it back on them, and I can see them, hmm, well, <laughs> kind of thinking through that. And, you know, these men on the Sanhedrin, uh, they are stubbornly continuing in a long tradition of persecuting God's messengers. And we think about it, and we could give literally dozens of examples here. They resisted Moses. They resisted Samuel, they resisted Elijah, they resisted Isaiah, they resisted Ezekiel, on and on and on. All through Jewish history, they were always doing something to harass God's prophets. And it just keeps going. And it seems as if all the prophets were persecuted in some way. And that's what Stephen is pointing out here. And I know we, we'd love to think, well, if we live back then... Uh, we wouldn't do that. If we lived back then, I would defend the prophets. I would be one of the prophets. And yet we need to understand that uh, in many cases, there's probably a pretty good chance that we might have been on the other side of things because that's what the majority of people did back then. They resisted the prophets. And that's why God sent the prophets because the people needed to hear some very difficult truth. And, and the natural reaction is to resist the truth, isn't it? If we're doing something wrong and somebody tells us we're doing something wrong, it seems like the natural reaction is to, no, no, I didn't. And, and then to maybe make reasons why that's not the case. And that's exactly what these guys are doing here. And so uh, God sent the prophets, they harassed the prophets, and this repeated itself over and over and over again. Uh, we just learned in Acts 6 verse 7 that a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And so the truth is obvious. Many of the religious leaders were believing and obeying the gospel. Once they had time to think about it, once they had time to maybe consult the scriptures and, and get things clear in their minds. But these men, the leaders on the Sanhedrin, they are the holdouts. These are men living with an extra dose of stubborn. And Stephen is calling them out on it. I've often said that uh, God can use stubborn people. In a sense, Moses was stubborn. In a sense, Peter was stubborn. And there, there are some value, there is a value to having a strong will, uh, but ultimately our will has to bend and bow before the Father. And once our will agrees with the Father's will, that's when God can use us in that way. I remember at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, I think it's in chapter 3, uh, I'm just paraphrasing here, I didn't look this up again today, but um, 
As I remember, God wanted um, Ezekiel's head to be as hard as Emory. And he's saying, I need you to be hard-headed. I need you to be just a little bit more stubborn than the people to whom you're preaching. Um, because I don't want them to uh, take advantage of you. You need to be just as stubborn as they are, but you need to teach the truth uh, without compromise. So anyway, these people are on the wrong side. And the stubbornness is continuing, and Stephen is calling them out on it. Uh, not only did their fathers persecute the prophets, also notice they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. So their forefathers had actually murdered God's prophets. They didn't just harass them. They didn't just chase them down, run them out of town. But they had murdered those who had announced the coming of Jesus. And now these men following in that pattern had actually gone above and beyond their forefathers by betraying and murdering the Son of God himself. And I find it interesting, thinking about this, that if what Stephen said was not true, these men would have objected. They would have said, no, we didn't. And yet they know it. They can't argue with this because they know Stephen could quote passages from the Old Testament proving this exact fact. Well, Stephen then emphasizes their hypocrisy by referring to them as those who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Um, so they had the right doctrine. This is the law of Moses, um, ordained by angels. That's a weird thing. The word, that's not used very often in Scripture. Um, I think it's there's a brief reference in the book of Galatians, maybe chapter 3, to the law being ordained or testified to by angels, something like that. We assume that angels played some role in communicating the law to Moses. But anyway, they had the right doctrine. The, the Jewish leaders did. Uh, they could have aced a test on the law of Moses. But they were not obeying the law of Moses. They knew it, but they were not doing it. Um, Stephen might have continued along this line of reasoning, but we'll never know. Because at this point, the audience interrupts the sermon. Only instead of interrupting to ask, what shall we do? As the 3,000 did on the day of Pentecost, these men have a different reaction. So let's continue on then with Acts 7, verses 54 through 60. Acts 7, 54 through 60. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. But when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. So like those on Pentecost, these men were also cut to the quick, weren't they? They were pierced in the heart, as we might say, as it's worded over in Acts 2, 38, or Acts 2, right before verse 38. But instead of asking what they needed to do, like the people on Pentecost did, these men are gnashing or grinding their teeth at Stephen. Uh, some of us have maybe been in a heated argument with somebody, and, and we can see them clench their teeth. Have you noticed that? You're, you're making a point and somebody doesn't agree or they're getting fired up and you can, you can see the anger in their jaw and the, the jaw is clenching. That seems to be what's happening here. They grind their teeth together. At this point, there's no violence, at least yet, but Stephen, full of the Spirit, gazes intently into heaven and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We have a few passages referring to Jesus sitting at God's right hand. And so there's been some discussion then as to what this means. Why is Jesus standing? Why is he not sitting here? And I wish we could discuss this in person, but in my mind, Jesus is really concerned about what he's seeing here. At least that's my opinion. Uh, at this critical moment of the sermon, and as the men on the Sanhedrin are grinding their teeth, in my mind, Jesus stands up almost as if to get a better view, almost out of, not excitement, but uh, out of the intensity of the moment. Um, almost like what we might see at a football game at a critical moment, if we could make that comparison. You know, something happens on the field and, and everybody stands up. It all hinges on this. Everybody jumps to their feet. And at least in my mind, that seems to be what's going on here. 
And when Stephen looks up, he can see this. That door cracks open into heaven just a little bit, and, and Stephen can see what's happening. Now, at this point, Stephen could have just kept quiet about this. He could have just looked into heaven and thought to himself, wow, that's, <laughs> that's an amazing thing that I'm seeing. Um, but instead of keeping quiet, notice Stephen tells these men what he sees. Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that statement right there is what puts these men completely over the edge. They cry out with a loud voice. They scream, they yell, whatever. They cover their ears and they rush towards Stephen in unison. It's almost as if there's no thinking going on. This is almost by instinct. They're so mad. They are out of control. They need to do whatever it takes to make this sermon stop. And so they drive him out of the city and they throw rocks at him until he is dead. In the middle of this, in verse 58, we find that those who are doing the stoning lay aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is our first introduction to Saul in the book of Acts. Uh, not really the way we're uh, might imagine being introduced to someone who will later be a hero in the book. Uh, but Saul, of course, is later converted. His name is changed to Paul. But here in the first reference, he's described as being young. So he's not an old man. He's a young man. He's also described as watching the coats of these men who are stoning Stephen. So as I understand it, Saul then is not actually throwing stones himself, but he's making this possible. You obviously can't kill someone with rocks while wearing your get dressed up and go to church clothes. You can't get your fancy robe all bloody while killing an innocent man in a violent rage. And so you have this young man there standing nearby. Keep watch over the pile of coats. And that is Saul's role in this. The Sanhedrin was traditionally made up of older men. They were known as the elders. Uh, but there is a remote chance that Saul might have been on the Sanhedrin. We can't say that for sure. It's a chance, though. I say this because of something Paul mentions later in Acts 26 as he makes his defense before King Agrippa. He refers to how he persecuted the church in his previous life. And he says, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. Some have seen that reference to casting my vote against them as a possible reference to Paul or Saul having voting privileges, perhaps even as a member of the Sanhedrin. So I wouldn't testify to that, uh, but it does at least seem to be a remote possibility. But what we know for certain is that Saul is clearly very closely associated with the Jewish ruling body. He's on the inside here. Even if he's not on the Sanhedrin, he's in the room, uh, apparently, when this thing happens. Um, remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the advice given by Gamaliel behind the scenes in the Sanhedrin. And remember his advice concerning this new movement? His advice was, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see what this new movement does. If it fizzles out, then, you know, it wasn't of God. But if, if they keep on growing and do well, then maybe God is behind it. So that was his advice. Remember him. Well, um, we learn later in the Bible that Paul was a student of Gamaliel. And so Saul is apparently being mentored by somebody in the Sanhedrin at some point in time. And he's present when these men decide to stone Stephen. So it's, it, maybe it's almost like he's clerking for the Sanhedrin. I had a friend that clerked for, a, oh, for some federal court judge. You know, and you, you clerk for somebody, you learn a lot about the, what happens behind the scenes. So it's almost like he's doing some kind of clerking or, or internship. Uh, by the way, uh, stoning seems like an absolutely horrific way to die, doesn't it? Um, we can hardly imagine that. We don't have that kind of thing around us in our country today. Thankfully, it is carried out in other parts of the world. Um, but we can maybe imagine, I mean, bones being broken and so on until the, the victim is finally killed, maybe by a crushing blow to the head, uh, something like that. I was reading up on some of the Jewish commentary on stoning. and You know, a certain number of paces away from the death site, you had to read the charges. A certain number of paces away, you had to give them one more opportunity to repent. And then when you got there, you had to kind of push them down into a hole. And if that killed them, well, you're good to go. Um, but if not, then the, the leading witness has to drop a rock on their chest. And if that rock crushes their chest and they die then, well, then that's the end of it. And if not, then everybody joins in. So they had all kinds of rules for this kind of thing. Um, but nevertheless, as these men throw stones at Stephen, uh, he is able to call out in the middle of it, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Uh, 
And then he falls to his knees and he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. As we think about those last two statements that Stephen makes in this life, do we see any parallels? Do we think about the death of Jesus at all here? Didn't Jesus say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit? And didn't Jesus also cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? It seems to me then that Stephen was perhaps listening to Jesus at the crucifixion. Either he was there or he heard about it. This is how Jesus died. And Stephen follows Jesus' example here. And with this, Luke says that Stephen falls asleep. That is, he dies. And so tonight we've learned Stephen is truly a great hero. The, the Sanhedrin set out to convict him, but he ended up convicting the Sanhedrin. This brings us to the end of Acts chapter 7, but the account of Stephen's death, it really flows into the next chapter. So as we wrap it up for tonight, let's briefly look at Acts 8, 1 through 4. And that'll be our last paragraph today. Acts 8, 1 through 4. Saul was in hearty agreement <clears throat> with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So, just to be clear, uh, Saul agrees with what happens to Stephen. He is in hearty agreement with putting him to death. So, he wasn't just a, a casual observer. He was more than just a bystander, but he really seems to be in on this. Um, Saul approves. And not only that, but the death of Stephen seems to inspire a massive new wave of persecution against the church. And this persecution... Uh, causes the early Christians to scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Uh, remember the outline from Acts 1 verse 8. We said we would uh, come back to that a few times throughout this book, and this is one of those times. Back in Acts 1 8, Jesus said to the apostles, And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And remember, we described this almost like a ripple in a pond. You throw a rock in a pond and the ripple moves out. The gospel would start in Jerusalem. It would move out to Judea and Samaria, and then it would spread to the remotest parts of the earth. Well, here in Acts 1, 8, 1, we definitely have growth now out of Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. Uh, here in our area, we might describe a movement spreading from Madison throughout Dane County and into the rest of South Central Wisconsin. So it's not everywhere yet, but it's moving out in that direction. And note the church spreads not because the apostles get together and come up with some brilliant plan sketched out on a whiteboard somewhere, but the church first spreads because of persecution. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. But let's just briefly notice at the end of verse 1 that the church scatters, but the apostles stay behind. So they stay behind. I mean, Jesus told them to stay in Jerusalem for a little bit, obviously, but they stay behind probably to take the brunt of the persecution, maybe because there's more work to do, more training to be done. But many of the other disciples, they simply scatter. They move to avoid persecution. And we should also note that when we're faced with persecution, sometimes running away might be an option. In other words, we don't necessarily need to stick around waiting to see what happens next, uh, waiting to get beaten or killed. But it, it seems here that if we have a way of escape, if we can take it without dishonoring the Lord in some way, then we need to let's, uh, you know, kind of seriously consider taking that just as these people did. In verse 2, some devout men bury Stephen, making loud lamentation over him. As I remember it, it was Jewish tradition not to mourn those who were executed for disobeying the law of Moses. I'm thinking about Nadab and Abihu, who were killed by God in Leviticus 10 for using unauthorized fire on the altar with the incense. After they were killed, Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. That's it. That's God's explanation after burning those two men to a crisp. And the text then says, So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. And at that point, Moses calls the relatives in and has them carry off the bodies. But he says, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you will not die, and that he will not become wrathful 
against all the congregation. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall bewail the burning which the Lord has brought about. You shall not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting, or you will die, for the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. Well, I found that interesting. Nadab and Abihu are killed by God. And as I understand it, the people are commanded not to mourn. God kills these people for disobeying, and God says, do not mourn these two men dying. To mourn would be to be sad over something that God had caused to happen. Now think about what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that? When they were struck dead for lying, they were also carried out quietly and quickly. And they were kind of disappeared. There, were, there was no funeral. There was no wailing or lamentation. But here in Acts 8, notice how the devout men made loud lamentation over Stephen. In other words, it seems that they might have been, in a sense, openly protesting what the Sanhedrin did here. In other words, we are not okay with this. What you did was not okay. In verse 3, we come back to Saul. We learn that at this point, Saul begins ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, putting them in prison. Uh, Saul then steps up as a leader, uh, the death of Stephen has given him a taste for it, perhaps, and now he takes on a leading role. And so he moves from holding the coats to taking more of a leadership role. Saul is on fire with this. This is his passion now. Uh, Saul is zealous. Uh, sometimes we might be tempted to think of the Apostle Paul as some kind of wimpy scholar. I don't know, a college professor type, you know, reading all day and, and kind of wimpy looking. But here we find Saul... He's in charge of kicking down doors, isn't he? Uh, this is the SWAT team of ancient Israel. He would break into homes. He would drag them back to Jerusalem, men and women, which is interesting. He doesn't care who he's picking on. Anybody who claims the name of Christ, he's after them. And presumably the goal here was to do to them what they did to Stephen. Uh, at the end of this passage in verse 4, we find that those who had been scattered uh, went about preaching the word. So they fled due to the persecution. But they did not stop preaching because of the persecution. Huge distinction to make there. They ran, but they preached the word of God as they were running. And this reminds us that Saul, who would end up as one of the most effective missionaries of all time, technically seems to have helped the church grow even before he became a Christian. Now, isn't that kind of strange to think about? Who's responsible for the growth of the early church here? Right now, it is Saul. It's not his intention, but that is exactly what happens. He's trying to stamp out the church, but in the process, he actually causes it to spread. And he caused it to spread according to the exact outline given by Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I've tried but failed to find a, a meme at the last few days. I don't know the exact wording of it. It was basically a, a statement inviting us to imagine those killed by Saul and in paradise, cheering as Paul arrives at the moment of his death. And it, it was a really interesting thought. So I don't know if that sounds familiar at all to you, or if you find it, uh, please let me know. But we have people dragged from their homes by Saul. And then once he is converted, in a chapter or two here, the tables will turn. And then Paul, or Saul, the policy is later known, is then on the receiving end of several decades of persecution himself. And so this brings us to a good place to pause for tonight. Uh, next week, let's pick up with Acts 8, verse 5, if the Lord wills. We might even start again with verse 4. Verse 4 is something of a transition. It really goes with the paragraph before it and after it. Uh, as the disciples scatter, preaching the word as they go, we'll focus in on one of those disciples, Philip, like Stephen, also one of the seven. So I would invite you to be reading ahead to all of Acts 8 this week. And let's be thinking of a way to summarize Acts 8 with a word or a phrase starting with the letter H. And we'll come back and discuss that next week. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you at worship on Sunday, uh, 9 o'clock or 1030. And for the fellowship in between, that, again this week, just absolutely encouraging. Uh, being able to see all of you again and being outside in the great outdoors. Looks like we're looking for some good weather, maybe a little bit warmer this coming Sunday. So let's uh, let's be looking forward to uh, coming together. And let's make a plan of encouraging somebody uh, when we are together. On your way to the church building, on your way to worship, be thinking, who will I encourage today and how will I do it? How can I be a blessing to somebody? Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven,
Thank you for the example of Stephen, and thank you for telling us about Saul, so that we can truly appreciate the change that takes place in his life. Tonight especially, we're thinking of our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted right now. We pray that your will would be done in all things, and we pray that no matter what happens, we would always represent you well. Thank you, Father, for being with us over the past year. We're thankful that we seem to have turned a corner with the pandemic. As we continue in a time of healing and transition, we pray that we would be patient with each other, and we pray we would always honor you in everything that we think and say and do. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.